shot there, 40. It's your identity, man. It's, like, it's you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, today's a special day. Uh, the last day I was a prosecutor in Baltimore City in early January 2015, uh, Commissioner Batts invited me to Comstat to address the rank and file, the lieutenants and majors, and the commissioner and deputy commissioners. I remember that day. It was after a period of relative progress and success in Baltimore. We'd had murders below 200. We had built a partnership between police and prosecutors that everyone was proud of. We didn't always agree, but we always knew that we were working as hard as we possibly could with mutual respect toward the common aim of making Baltimore safe. I remember addressing the cops the men and women who honor this city with their service. The men and women who kiss their children goodbye in the morning, put a badge and a gun on, and walk into the most dangerous city in this country at a time when it isn't particularly fashionable to be a police officer and serve and protect, and pray that they make it home at night. I remember sharing with the men and women in that room, that I, for one, considered them heroes, that I, for one, honored the risks and sacrifices they took each and every day to make this city as safe as it could be. I was chief of major investigations in that moment. 
I was appointed deputy attorney general and a few short days later, I would look back upon my days with fondness as a city prosecutor. What I didn't know in January of 2015 is that all the progress we had made, that the progress we had made together on the shoulders of the work that had been done for years would disintegrate, that that foundation that we thought would survive the test of time would not survive the next state's attorney. By that summer, dozens of people had left the office. By the end of the year, we had the highest murder rate in America, 348 homicides in 2015. We thought it was an anomaly. We thought the earthquake of Freddie Gray had caused the progress to recede, but that we would be back in 2016. But we now know, looking back upon eight years of slaughter on the streets of Baltimore, that that wasn't an anomaly. It was a prelude to the worst period of Baltimore history. That last day, I told the men and women of the police department that it was the honor of a lifetime to have worked shoulder to shoulder with them in the trenches, making Baltimore a little bit safer, building cases, carjackings, shootings, killings, gang cases, big and small. We worked those cases because we knew what was at stake. We took pride in the work. Uh, they were some of the best days of my career. Uh, they were some of the best partnerships and friendships of my life. Uh, so it is with that in mind that I am so humbled and so honored to share the support and endorsement of so many men and women that have led this police department. For five police commissioners and the police chief from Baltimore County to come together in solidarity, in support of our campaign is as great an honor as I have had in my life. Uh, but it isn't just about me. I, I certainly appreciate the kind words they have shared, and I hope will share today, <laughs> about the work that we have done in Baltimore City. They're coming together because we face a crisis the likes of which we have never seen before. This unprecedented moment is a collective show of alarm that something has to be different or this slaughter will continue. We lose in the annals of time the names of the people that have died on the streets of Baltimore. The only thing we remember are the numbers. But they are coming together today to remind us that it doesn't have to be this way, that it hasn't always been this way, that they have worked shoulder to shoulder with prosecutors, with mutual respect and admiration, not always agreeing, knowing that part of our job is to hold them accountable and knowing that part of their job is to push us, to take cases, to work cases, even when we disagree. Um, I can't say uh, all the things I want to say because today is really about their concerns, their words of support. Um, but I will just say this, thank you. Thank you for stepping away from what you ordinarily do, which is to be the men and women and lead the men and women into danger, to encourage them to race towards the fire when the rest of us are supposed to be kept at a safe distance. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for stepping into the political fray. It's not where you spend your lives. It's not where I imagine you feel most comfortable. But we don't have time to say and do the things that are comfortable anymore. We have to do something different. Uh, and with that, I am gonna turn it over to uh, people that I call friends, people that I have called partners, people that I am honored and humbled today to have the support and endorsement of. Uh, Chief Johnson, let me start with you. Well, thank you, uh, Theroux, and, and good morning, everyone. When we think about public safety in Baltimore and the region, we think about change. We think about individuals who have the energy, the enthusiasm, and a desire to take us forward, to take Baltimore and the region back to the crime numbers that we once experienced as children and as we grew up in this great area. 
I stand with my colleagues today, and I'm very proud to do that, by the way, to endorse through for the state's attorney of Baltimore City. I'm extraordinarily confident that he's going to bring the necessary skills and abilities to address violent crime in this great city, and it will affect the entire state of Maryland. And again, it's my honor to be with him and encourage him along uh, in this uh, great, great, uh, noble cause. Uh, it's my honor today also to stand uh, with uh, one of my uh, comrades in, in public safety, Ed Norris. And Ed has a few words to speak as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. I'm Daryl D'Souza. Thanks. Thanks. I'm not Ed Norris. We both look good, though, right? Um, I just, We're fine. I just want to take a little time to kind of talk about the relationship that um, we, when I say we, the police department, had with Taru. Um, and I specifically recall the times that uh, we met and the times that we interacted on a regular basis was uh, when I was a commander of the Northeast District. And you came to our intel meetings. And our intel meetings consisted of um, intelligence community within the police department, the men and women who respected you. And what you did was you talked and you helped facilitate and we collaborated um, about big, about suspects, about the violent, the violent suspects. I mean, the repeat offenders. And we had these conversations and we gave you names through our officers, we gave you the names. And based on the names that we gave you, every single week, either you or your team would come to the police station during our intel meetings. And we'd have these conversations about the progress, where we stand with them, if they were arrested, um, where they were throughout the court system. Um, you really believed in victims' rights. Um, and I truly believe, I truly believe moving forward that this is what the city needs. Um, you mentioned it that the uh, violence is just really at a pace where we cannot sustain. I mean, one is too many. And I honestly feel that you, um, in that position, um, your passion, um, your attention to the duty, uh, to the work, is gonna really make a difference in Baltimore City. So I'm happy to support you. Thank you, sir. When I came here, um, I didn't quite know what to expect. I mean, coming to the city 22 years ago. And I, unfortunately, what I found then still remains, and it's got to change. And that is passivity, acceptance of a level of violence that is seen nowhere else in the country, not even in the third world. And it's disturbing to me to watch this over the years, and particularly now, as it's completely, lo we've lost control completely. The city is either in control or under control, and right now we're not in control. And I just want to give you, I live my life through statistics, and that's how I ran the police department. Countries that the State Department tells you not to travel to, like say the Dominican Republic or Ecuador, or a place where we have a lot of crime, their murder rate's about 13 per 100,000. We are 58 per 100,000. You wouldn't be allowed to travel here if we were a country by the United States. No one seems to understand that. And I've never seen a city with a murder rate this high that people shrug their shoulders and tell me, oh, this is Baltimore, it's the way it's always been. That's not an answer. That's not acceptable. You can't have it that way. And I'm really disgusted now because I watch, you know, people, the current leadership and, and people in positions of power now telling me they need five years, 10 years. You don't have 10 years. That'll be 4,000 more people dead. Think about it. And to say that with a straight face and tell it to the population who lives here is just disgraceful to me. And that's the reason I'm here today because I had a long conversation with you about this. And what I look for in people, I mean, a lot of people have skill. There's a lot of smart people in public service. You certainly got all that. But very few people have drive and a, a real sense of urgency. And that's what you need in this business. Like, you have to treat, <laughs> sounds silly, you have to treat this as a matter of life and death because it is. And, and that's what I really liked about the route best is that there's a plan, there's a deadline, there's an actual plan and a goal to drive the murders down to where they were, below 200. That's where they need to go, and not to have it. My first press conference here, I told all you guys, I'd get below 300 murders that year. Everybody laughed because it was impossible. We did it, and my successors all yep. drove it down further to a point where it was actually, we had optimism in the city. We don't have that anymore. We don't. As you said, there was a slaughter going on in the streets. 
you can't live like this. No city in America should just accept this level of violence, shrug their shoulders, and hope it goes away, because hope is not a strategy. And we have a strategy here. We've got a sense of urgency. We've got someone who's willing, willing to be held accountable. And that's what I'm looking for in a leader. I don't want someone to hope it goes away and just sort of you know, drive around and, and, and watch this blood literally running in the streets of this city and think that's okay and have done a good job. So that's it. And that's why I support the Rue, and that's why I took my time to come here today. And I, I hope he wins. So. Um, good morning. My name is Anthony McCarthy. I have the honor of serving on the Thru Vignaraja team. I have been in Baltimore politics for almost four decades. I know it's hard to believe because I look under 40. But for more than four decades, I've served two members of Congress, a United States Senator, four mayors. And I sat in those rooms and we talked about violence, but there was always a sense of hope. And I will tell you, Daryl D'Souza and Eddie um, Norris inspired us every time we got together because they believed in this city, because they believed in the people. I left government and I have to tell you that my heart was absolutely broken. Our city is in trouble. People are afraid. Grandmas don't sit on their steps anymore. Children don't play in the streets. And on the occasion that they do, it is sad to say, we have lost children, we have lost grandmothers, we've lost hope. I had almost lost hope in this city. And then I met through Vignaraja. And I have to tell you, I didn't want to like him. I did not want to like him at all. But the more I talked to him, the more I heard his story, and the more I heard him talk about Baltimore, I realized it wasn't about through, it was about service. And he is determined to serve. And when we got these commissioners together, I was first thinking, they're not gonna do it. They're not gonna do it. But he talked to each one of them and before I knew it, we were planning this press conference for you. There's hope. Hope is on the way again. Um, all we have to do is put the work in and have very high expectations. The expectations from City Hall, the expectations from the State Attorney's Office, they're low for the people of Baltimore. We want much more for them. And with through Vignaraja as our State's Attorney, we will bring our city back. Thank you. Um, I wanna make sure that there's any questions that we take them, um, but I wanna at least close these opening remarks by saying this. Um, I'm not gonna honor all of what you've said today by saying thank you. I'm gonna honor what you have said today and the confidence that you've put in me by working my tail off by waking up early and going to bed night late and working every weekend to make sure that we deliver on this promise. Because this is just politics. I'm in the middle of a campaign and all of this is what I hope will be the prelude to the Renaissance of Baltimore. The opening chapter to the real book, to the real story about how we turn this work around. Because this vote of confidence means nothing if we're back here in a couple of years talking about 300 more murders. When I ran for mayor, I said, if I don't get murders below 300, I won't run again. When I started this race, I said, that same pledge remains because if you can't drive down the murder rate in this city, you don't deserve another shot. That's what you're running on. That's what you're pledging to the people of Baltimore. And if you want the job because you like the title, there's lots of great titles. But if you want the job to actually drive down violence, to make this city safer, to make sure that the grandmothers can sit out on their stoops, that the children can go to the school around the corner, that you don't have open air drug markets on the way, you don't have carjackings and shootings and killings, peppering the headlines every night. If that's what you want to do, that's why you're getting into public service, then deliver. So Commissioner Norris, Chief Johnson, Commissioner D'Souza, 
to the commissioners that couldn't be here but have lent their support and their wisdom to me, my pledge to you is that I will honor your vote of confidence by getting the job done, by pushing my prosecutors and pushing your police to be the best that they can be, to be the kind of public servants that this city deserves, the kind of public servants that this city needs. Thank you so much for honoring me and humbling me with your support. Any questions? Look, um, this isn't about me. This is about the collective wisdom and the collective experience that they have over the span of decades. They've, been, they've seen this city at its best and its worst. They've seen it making modest progress and they've seen it downslide and spiral in terrible ways. For them to come together in this moment uh, in a joined chorus of voices saying enough is enough, Something has got to give, something has got to change. And here's a person who believes in this city more, that believes in the police department, that believes in the community enough to actually turn things around. Um, it is the honor of a lifetime. Uh, and I think it speaks as much to our partnerships in the past as it does to this crisis in the moment. Quickly. Yeah. Um, the, the, the role of the police commissioner or police chief is absolutely essential in public safety, but that collegial relationship with the state's attorney is absolutely vital to the success of driving down both violent crime and property crime. Absent that collegial interconnection, we will fail, mm -hmm. and we have. So I believe, and I believe my associates believe, that based upon our observations collectively, I don't know what we represent, 150 years of service. Um, we believe, <laughs> the most important person. Um, we believe that Theroux brings that to the table. We're aligned behind him and his vision. And I believe if he's successful, we're gonna see a safer Baltimore and frankly, the region, the Baltimore metropolitan region. Any other questions? Look, um, it's not that helpful to engage in a lot of finger pointing. Uh, there's lots of blame to go around. The partnerships are all frayed. The relationships are all broken. The trust has dissolved in our leaders' ability to turn things around. Uh, the thing I hear the most is hopelessness. They think, wh why? Sh there's no it's never going to get better. It, it can't possibly get better. It's been like this forever. Uh, but these men and women can tell you it's not true. It wasn't always this way. It wasn't always this bad. Um, and what I see and fear in the current approach is a complacency, a willingness to surrender to this culture of low expectations, to believe that tomorrow is not going to be better than yesterday. Um, that's a damn shame to think that you got into public service pledging that things may or may not get better in five or 10 years. What kind of pledge is that? What kind of inspiration is that? But I've said this before, talk is cheap. Uh, go look at my record. I was a federal and city prosecutor. I was deputy attorney general of Maryland. In each and every one of those roles, when I was a line prosecutor, whether I was a manager, or whether I was deputy attorney general, I rolled up my sleeves and I did the work. I went out to the crime scenes with the folks that these men and women sent into danger. I went into the courtroom, not just to observe my prosecutors, but to try cases. Um, I am so proud that I earned the respect and admiration of the rank and file, not because I was nice to them, but because I was tough, but because I made them do the work too. And I made them understand that I would make my prosecutors do the work. Um, that's what I'm gonna deliver. That's what I'm gonna uh, 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 promise. And uh, the folks in power now, I, I, I'm going to be as polite as I can. I'm going to be a partner to them. Um, but I wasn't always nice to these guys. We had arguments. We had disagreements. We had behind closed doors instances where we had to talk things through. But a partner is not supposed to be your cheerleader. A partner is supposed to be your partner. 
They're supposed to push you to be your best, and they're supposed to push you to be your best. Um, that's what I'm promising to the current leadership and to the police department. Uh, help is on the way. Hope is on the way. Uh, but we're not going to be all rainbows and, and sunshine. We got some work to do to bring this slaughter under control. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Yes. Can I just say a, a, a couple of people that I'm so honored to have standing shoulder to shoulder with these great commissioners. Um, I thought it was important for everyone to be reminded of why we're here. There are people whose wisdom uh, is unmatched. Uh, Councilwoman Ricky Spector, who's been through thick and thin with me, is the longest serving city councilwoman in Baltimore history. Still living. Uh, if you spend any time in South Baltimore, you will see her walking yep. miles, miles every day uh, to make sure uh, that she and the people know that her work is not done. Uh, Donna Rubottom has served this city as part of law enforcement uh, for many moons because it's not just the leadership, it's also the rank and file. And I end with perhaps the most important person uh, who has become a friend. Uh, Ms. Velma, Ms. Velma Warland, um, Ms. Velma Marshall, excuse me, um, uh, has been a friend uh, for a long time, unfortunately, because she was one of the many mothers in this town who suffered the unthinkable. Uh, her son died a couple decades ago. 1999, he was killed on the streets of Baltimore. Her son-in-law died, was killed, uh, this past Christmas. Um, she's seen it all and it hasn't changed. Um, we're not doing this for the title. I promise you we're not doing it for the paycheck. We're doing it so that Velma Moreland knows, that Velma Marshall knows that what happened to her family is going to happen to fewer and fewer families and one day we all hope to no one's family. There are places in America where murders don't happen. There are places in Maryland where murders don't happen, where it's not 300 or 200 or 100, it's zero or one or two. You need um, to win for the good people of Baltimore City. <laughs> yes. We need to win for the good people of Baltimore City, for the mothers and fathers that have seen it all, that have suffered through it, but still believe that the best days of Baltimore are ahead. Thank you again. Thank you so much. a lot.